lately, so this is better. I'm Jose Ustanga, I work in uh, Oklahoma State in the Turkish College of I, uh, multicultural program, so part of my job is uh, facilitate, provide uh, faculty with, you know, support for study abroad. Uh, this is part of my dissertation, so uh, just wanna, you know, that's why I'm presenting kind of the two abstracts in one. Uh, it's part of like four, uh, kind of four components. Three components, basically three phases of four components. Uh, and then I'm gonna do like introduction, uh, like for the two abstracts, and then I'm going to transition to like methodology and results for each of them, and conclusion will be the same. So just wanna warn you. So uh, when you ever thought of being a veterinarian? Okay, good. So can I hear like what age were you when you thought about that? That's like the earliest career I can remember. Age like four or five. Four or five? Okay, four good. Five. Keep that in mind because I think that'll be important. So uh, these these are you know the two papers. As you can see, one is about the, the, the experiences using uh, uh, phenomenology, and the other one is retrospective evaluation uh, of the study of the So uh, and I'm gonna. I'm presenting on behalf of you know, my colleagues and you know, basically my dissertation committee and some colleagues in, in uh, a University of Mexico. So I just uh, want to start with this. Uh, it was a case study, so I'm bound with everything in a case study. And in a case study, you know, according to Creswell, well, 2008, you uh, start with an empty vignette at the beginning of the case study to finish with you know, some case assertions uh, that will uh, lead you to a closing begin. So this is what uh, I spread, I spread it for so uh, in 2004. I mean, you don't mind reading that, I really appreciate that. Uh, so keep that uh, opening opinion in mind as we go through the presentation. Uh, and I want you to take a look at this. A lot of the students in the US, they'll go to college thinking that they want to apply or wanting to apply uh, to best. We're talking about, about 42,000 applicants and uh, about 5,000 seats in best schools in the US. And you know, there's, there's students that apply more than one time uh, the last, I mean, in the College of Bible, Oklahoma State, the last number that I remember is 46% of our new first-time students, basically freshmen, coming to the college uh, like with the intention to apply to that school with a pre-med option. And I'll be talking about pre-med pre students throughout the presentation. That's the way that I will uh, take it. Uh, you know, basically the lead review is uh, three components. Uh, application requirements, and then we move to uh, practice options and prof what I call professional expectations of a, uh, a doctor of veterinary medicine. And in uh, application requirements, we have course prerequisites, uh, GPA, and you know, GRE basically, and practice experience. So let's review that. If you have you know, our first handout, we will have some of that information. We're basically talking about 59. Uh, Member institute institutions from the uh, uh, Association of American Veterinary Medical Colleges, and they require about you know, 25 courses recommended or required. You can see the list in there. Uh, it's interesting that you know, like Bruce mentioned, that a lot of students will repeat like chemistry or those courses like probably an average of three three times. So they spend a lot of time trying to fulfill those requirements. And the academic value you know, has been questioned, and you can you know, go to Cogan and, and look you know, what uh, they say about you know, like the academic value of those courses. Now, you can see here you know, that uh, in, re in regards to application requirements, it's pretty competitive. This is the US average uh, for GPA, you know, and uh, applicants to best school, you know, it's higher. And they're pretty competitive when we compare that with the average you know, like numbers in the US. Uh, for, you know, like practice experience, the average applicant to med schools in the US has 2,000 hours of uh, experience. 
The important thing here is that that will usually mirror the practice option, the specialty that they go in uh, med school when they you know, go to med school. Now, uh, it's important to mention that there is a imbalance you know, within those practice options. And uh, you can see that you know, hand up as well. Uh, hand up too, you know, to give you a good sense of you know, uh, what the profession is in regards to practice options. And they basically divide that up in uh, private you know, clinical practice and public and corporate employment. What I want to highlight from there is, you know, like companion animal, especially, you know, female, is 64% of pets in the U.S. So uh, we're talking uh, about, you know, like, as, you know, uh, also like surplus of about 9 to 12,000 uh, pets. And remember that, that there's an imbalance. We have a lot of pets wanting to do combined animals. And we don't have a lot of pets like uh, wanting to do probably uh, like rural right, like practice. So uh, and that, that represents about 10 to 15 percent of the uh, professions like capacity. So that's a uh, uh, application requirements now. Professional expectations. This is what I uh, get a little concerned about. Look at this. Uh, suicide for female veterinarians is four times higher than the average US population. It's one of the professions with the highest rate of suicide. I know a lot of students, I work with a lot of students, and I don't really want to see one of them uh, going to that, or anybody, honestly. Uh, so, you know, those are some of the, uh, you know, stressors that trigger uh, those factors. There's a lot of stress, uh, you know, school debt, not very, you know, there, there are students, you know, like, owning, like, probably $500,000, more than that, uh, when they graduate from med school. You know, performing internationally, and you can go to those sources and look at you know that the challenges that veterinarians face in the U.S. Now, uh, why you know like proposing your story abroad as a uh, uh, alternative, you know, to uh, help students aspiring to be veterinarians to get exposed to the profession? You know, there's a lot of you know like uh, research about you know like the value of a story abroad to uh, like you know enhance career development. See it like that. You know, there's uh, various things, you know, competencies and, and those things. Uh, now let's, you know, let's move a little bit to career motivation, which is, you know, like the topic here. So career motivation is sort of like a, uh, a concept that is internal to the individual, right? So what we're looking here, you know, is like uh, the motivation is driving like pre-med students to uh, seek like, you know, veterinary medicine exposure to animals usually doing you know like remember that we said it right like we're like five, six, eight, I'm like, I wanna be a pet. Right. So uh, you know like perception like veterinarians play a key like role in their decisions. You know and decides to work with animals and, and, and so forth. Now uh, with so much as A, you know, going back to you know the issues that they face and then the limited research about, you know, like using a study abroad as a way to help, you know, uh, aspiring veterinarians to see if that's really what they want to do. That's why, you know, I wanted to, uh, you know, like engage in this research. Uh, conceptual framework, we, uh, we use uh, human capital theory, you know, like productivity. It's about, you know, knowledge and also health. We talk about, you know, like uh, basically mental health and here. So, uh, you know, my uh, basic thesis, you know, is that historical uh, courses may contribute to the development of human capital. Uh, it will depend on the students, you know, their career aspirations, wanting to be veterinarians. Uh, the context of the experience, you know, including, uh, you know, three med students, right? So, uh, I, uh, we use the uh, interest based motivation theory as our uh, theoretical framework. There is basically like an individual interest, you know, like what I like. And there is always, you know, like this thing that they call interestedness, which is like situational interest. I like something, but I mean, if, if I engage in a situation or something, my interest may change. And the way that we basically operate is uh, like the way that this is, you know, like done in the, in the story is that, you know, students have the aspirations to be a veterinarian. 
right? They go to the story of God, which is, you know, this will be representing situational interest, you know, this, this will be uh, individual interest, you know, wanting to be a man. And then, you know, the outcome will be I either stay in the profession or depart, you know, my interest, right? Not the profession, right? Like my interest. So uh, this is, you know, asset one. Again, and this is going to be, you know, particular to the uh, the after that, you know, like we're talking about today. Uh, this is basically phenomenology, and uh, uh, you know, we wanted to, you know, look at the lived experiences of uh, private students regarding their participation in this study abroad to Mexico in the summer of uh, 2019. We had uh, 25 private students. And you can see their uh, demographic info in handout three. Methodology, uh, you know, it's part of the larger study, and you can see in handout four how uh, that was, you know, like uh, that in the study. So basically, today I'm presenting uh, the four voice narratives, bearing, you know, on the top, and evaluation results in the mean. That's the second. Uh, like uh, after. So in the large story, we use uh, a case story in this method. That's why I'm using this, you know, uh, opening vignette and closing vignette. And then, uh, you know, we use several uh, complementary research methods. And I'm basically presenting uh, two specific ones today. And, uh, you know, just wanted to highlight that we use the, you know, the 8810 criteria by Tracy. For uh, quality and quality of research, a lot of progressivity bracketing, and I'll say, you know, like uh, providing those hands out probably you no know, speaks to that. Uh, being transparent about it, you know, like uh, all the uh, information here. Uh, quality and quantitative, you know, for the evaluation, you know, internal validity, making sure that we are uh, measuring what we're supposed to do, and external validity that we can, you know, like, uh, if not generalize. Uh, you know, in qualitative research, or generalized, uh, or transferability, right? So, phenomenology, uh, you know, an approach that allows researchers to, you know, elucidate, uh, explicate, uh, and interpret, uh, you know, the essence, basically, of a uh, phenomenon and shared experience. Like Kimbo uh, and uh, others, they reported uh, a phenomenology story that. Participants in young uh, farmers' clubs in Uganda uh, were, you know, like motivated by, you know, like uh, their participation, and that's how they make choices, you know, to go in careers in hand. Now, this is the basic method, uh, methodology that we use, and you can see that in handout five. Uh, those are like the name of the journals. So the basic, you know, like uh, source of data here was a uh, like traditional journal uh, assignment for the students. Then uh, we used that from the students and we uh, conducted like word frequency analysis. And then from that word frequency analysis, we uh, looked at context, you know, context, contextual information. Uh, you know, like a lot of open issues, you know, selective coding. Uh, and then we, uh, Know, arrive in significant statements, right? Like, uh, traditional qualitative research to uh, get to themes, and then from those themes, the essence of the phenomenon. Now, those are, uh, you know, I'll start with the findings there. You know, there are 40 significant statements, uh, as you can see, handout six, and that basically has, you know, the statements here, and uh, also, you know, the Supporting words, and those are basically, you know, like uh, codes, keywords, uh, a lot of uh, coding analysis. Uh, 24 teams arose from that, and in handout six, I have an extra one that is part of my dissertation that I'm not presenting today, but I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, provide it to you, which is related to culture. Yeah, those are the two, uh, the three, uh, the last three, two pages. So let's see. Uh, here, so 10 emergence you know, themes related to the practice of that man in Mexico. And you know, again, go back to uh, handout six if you want to you know, look at those. Um, I have here, you know, more than just uh, the uh, 
you know, the, the writing of your notes. You know, I, I wanted to have this graph just to show you that this was, you know, like a case study. And, uh, you know, like it's not only the writing journals, but also the photo journals, but we're focusing today on the uh, writing journals, right? So those are the emerging themes. As you can see there, you know, we have uh, several different things, access to care from, you know, work settings from beds. So I'm presenting a selected, you know, like a uh, number of those, just for your reference in the interest of time. So let's see, you know, like this, this would be, you know, like the, uh, you know, like the, the writing portion, the uh, journey portion of it. And this photo will, you know, like probably speak to that as well. So see here, you know, like uh, student 14, you know, what they highlighted here. Basic care given to animals is typically, you know, food and shit. That exercise, you know, gets from uh, work. And, you know, as you can see here, you know, like people weigh in their clinics, uh, then in Mexico, this is the team of access to care. Interesting that, you know, like uh, another thing, you know, related to the actual practice of that in Mexico, you know, like uh, a lot of range of different cases, like, you know, flowing that pets will not usually see in different animals. And the, the different things that the students do. Now, uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, work settings for pets. See, the day, the day was long and hot. It was long and hot. I, I remember that. But the pets never, you know, gave up. They kept working. Right? And, uh, you know, even you know, in these conditions, we learned about uh, different things. So now, uh, about the uh, the influence of culture on the uh, practice of pet men in Mexico, we had uh, this eight years. And see, this is, this is really interesting because the students were looking at things like, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, welfare, and, you know, uh, which of animals, of animals, like, getting paid, uh, caretakers, there's a realization here. Women who are in charge of the household, they usually take care of animals and children. You will never see that in the U.S. That's what it's going to say. I know for work. You know, we had a good time saying, like, hey, please don't pet the dog. Those are working dogs. are not like that for issues. So see what the student 21 said here. You know, uh, animals are used for work. You can read that. Dogs have a working purpose as well. Now, we switch to, you know, like, complex space welfare. The problem is welfare is often tossed out because it needs to work. This horse was in a lot of photos, right? This is photo boys, you know, that was my uh, uh, poster actually. And, uh, you know, this horse, you know, would be probably uh, put, you know, down in the U.S. You know, so this horse has been working for 15 years and there's no problem for them. Now, about the, uh, you know, like, give back to the community tradition. Read this. This is really powerful for me. The importance, you know, of students giving out to the community. You know, we don't see that the U.S. government highlighted that. Now, impact of study abroad on uh, students' career aspirations. We have these teams. Uh, you can see, you know, go back to the handout as well. You see that those contextual words, those keywords, those. See, when I saw that, that's the way that the vets were working, I was seriously thinking about, you know, becoming a pet man, especially. I realized that vets do a lot more than just cats and dogs and horses. They can also do fish, right? Uh, learning of medical production. See, with that means, I mean, although this is, you know, but other ways, it feel like it's pretty good with that. Social economics. There's a lot of, you know, like, uh, relationships, you know, like, and you see the same words again. 
So uh, learning of constraints with better procedures. See all the you know the things that the students were doing. You know, looking at medicine as a holistic, you know, like uh, like profession. So that's for after one. Now after two is basically a uh, retrospective evaluation. So what I wanted to see was the impact of the uh, you know study abroad on students, like basically academic motivation. Same thing here, you can go back to handout three to see the demographics. So what we did it was a retrospective evaluation. You know, uh, trying to you know look at response to chief bias. You know, like uh, they'll say that uh, you know retrospective evaluation is probably better to avoid that. You know, like changes in perceptions, either like a post and a pre and then a post, and uh, you know. Uh, how they want to say that the advanced level, but you know, like we mentioned it, what we were supposed to mention. Uh, so we did an online survey, we sent it to students, you know, two questions were related to their actual demographics. You will see uh, questions, you know, you will see questions one and two in the actual statistics, you will see more than uh, uh, two to eight. So uh, they range from you know very motivated to very motivated or very certain to very uncertain. We did descriptive, descriptive statistics, and you know since we didn't have a uh, you know like uh, our uh, basically data was uh, not concept. Uh, we did like a week of sign that test. So this is basically uh, the uh, significant, you know, like, like the C scores for the questions. You look at this, you know, like uh, before this study about now you go back how certain, you know, uh, your focus on that man, you know, that was significant. Also, uh, you know, compared to what you learned and now how you feel about the profession, that was also significant. And you know, like wanting to do better in a school that was also significant. You can see, uh, you know, uh, hand out three for you know, questions. Uh, those are big and standard deviations. You'll see some changes in there. I want to show the uh, other ones. But I wanted to, uh, you know, do this graph so you can see how they shifted, right? So uh, if you look at here, you know, before the three, we had a lot of students, you know, like that, uh, where very certain, and then we didn't have anybody. So that shift a little bit, and that's what I wanted to see, like right? that shift to that. That was our data, it was, you know, not normally distributed. Now, for the other one, uh, knowledge about the profession, same thing in very clue that we didn't have anybody. They thought they were more knowledgeable about the profession. And then, um, you know, I wanted to do better in school. We changed here from uh, 10 to 20 there to do. <coughs> so that was good. Now, this is it was this is one that was not you know, a statistical significant. See what happened here. You know, we uh, didn't have, so this is before three, how likely were you to drop the private option? We didn't have anybody dropping the private option. We only had two wanting to drop the private option, hopefully because of the story about it, which is for me, you know, the value of this, right? I want to see, you know, I don't want to see them here. I want to see them either here or here, right? Uh, so, you know, conclusions and implications. You know, there's 52% uh, of participants were minority students. That doesn't happen a lot. Uh, you know, in like, study about it, I was you over the US in general, freshman. I know that a lot of colleges and universities, you know, put a lot of emphasis on doing it. You know, like they're like either juniors or seniors, I'm the opposite. And there's a lot of research saying that if they do it in the freshman year, they're likely to like long term. There's a lot of uh, value uh, on it. Like 20% per gen, you 
you see that numbers are pretty low in the US. And you know, there's a lot of relationship between you know the study abroad and session, which is good for you know, especially uh, minority uh, populations that are underrepresented. So if, if you remember, you know, the, the, the data, you know, students it basically, you know, like compared it was you know contrasted the, the profession in contextualized you know, between the US and Mexico. Uh, you know, they highlighted that things like access to care, you know, on the uh, practice of ethnic social economics are really entangled with you know the professions. Now uh, so overall I think the students realize that the profession in Mexico is structured differently than the US which I don't give a lot of value to that. Uh, now, uh, more about it, you know, like the student, you know, seeing, saying, this student do saying, you know, like, we can speak a different language, but the actual profession is the same language. That, for me, has a lot of value. Uh, and they were able, you know, to uh, distinguish that and also, you know, like, going to some, you know, like, cultural shock. Now, uh, about the practice of, you know, bad men and the influence of culture, if you, if you, you know, remember, you know, there's a lot of traditions where you know, students do highlight, you know, welfare is different in Mexico. And this thing about giving back to the community, they highlighted that a lot. So as reflected on their own culture, again, you know, like challenging their preconceived notions of their profession. Uh, you know, hopefully, you know, the courses, you know, like, help them to see another, you know, component of the professional on the glamorous view of it. Uh, and then, if you remember, you know, it helped the students to either confirm or disconfirm their aspiration. But I think we need a lot of that, you know, exposure. Uh, and motivated them to do better in school. So, you know, like, the influence on them, the real aspirations, and according, you know, to the, uh, you know, again, like IBM T theory, students' personal interest in becoming the nice were influenced by the situation of interest represented and manifested by the participation in the in the course, which led them to either, you know, like say this is for me or this is not for me. Recommendations, you know, I wish that uh, we can do like more about. Uh, we can keep more records about you know, their transition to, to, to a school. We don't have a lot of that. I haven't been able to find like, you know, like a good note, like a uh, number of students who are in the paper option in the US. And if anybody uh, knows about it, please let me know. Uh, you know, advisory committees may, may be a good idea. And then, you know, private clubs, you know, keeping, you know, uh, giving information to students. This is, you know, like a lot more additional research, like academic components, you know, doing this more on the, uh, like, three components that I mentioned before, application requirements, practice options, and professional implementations. And then uh, see how, you know, like, when they get to school, those who get best school and those who didn't, you know, how they get compared. And, you know, and, and overall, you know, more students that, keep looking at you know their perceptions and, and when they decide that they want to be a vet and when they you know depart that profession and why. So you know closing in the end as a case study, this is what I have. You know, appreciate you to read that. And that goes pretty well with you know what this record you know like kind of or so in twenty in two thousand and four. That's kind of, you know, the essence also of the phenomenology research uh, after one. And I think that that's all I have.
in this particular case, you know, this option, we focus on equities, like horses, uh, donkeys, and mules. And the students, you know, like, they do, uh, like, cool activities, like aging horses by their teeth. You know, they learn to do that, they really like that. That's how they look at it. You know, we go to, like, a, a zoo and look at, you know, like, soils and those things. So just try to expose them to those options. Oh, is that me? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. That was my answer. Yeah. Anything else? So as you're looking at this and thinking about the impact of this on, I mean, veterinary medicine in the United States and trying to build that comparison for students, I mean, depending on which organizations definition of developing versus developed country. Um, Mexico could still be listed as a developing country. Mm -hmm. how, is, how do you think that those comparisons relate to the experiences that these students would have in their practical experiences while they're, when they actually get into and they graduate from veterinary school? Well, it's, it's pretty eye-opening for them. You know, it's, it's, if you use, you know, so the, uh, their statements there, you know, they realize that we have, I mean, in the U.S., there's a transition from like work animals to companion animals, and then uh, you know, I think that you know, exposing them to do that is is a good thing. In Mexico and many other you know countries have a different like system. You know, they students go directly from high school to veterinary medicine. You know, in the U.S., you usually go to uh, although you have to. Usually go and get a uh, bachelor degree and apply to uh, vet school. So I, I mean, I think exposing them to you know like differences between the professions you know, is pretty eye-opening, and you know it's kind of one also for them to realize that they don't necessarily have to be a vet or an animal. You know, in the way that you know like in Mexico they look at vet vet is more holistically so. You know, the, 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 the vets that we work with, they usually have like a sociologist, you know, that they will talk about, you know, the connection between animals and the people. Because, uh, you know, if, if you have a scar that is happening every other, you know, month, there's something wrong with, you know, like, there's something wrong with it. It's just not the, the dog right? You mentioned that there was a high population of freshmen students that were part Did you actively recruiting? Yes. Or, or was that just kind of there? No, I, I do actively recruit freshmen. Right. Especially to this point, because I think that the, the uh, sooner that we expose them, you know, to more options, the sooner that they may realize that, that that is either for them or not, if, you know, that serves as, a, as an option. Yes, I go to, uh, you know, like a lot of different, like, freshman events on campus, yeah. and I talk to them about it. And we have, at, at any given point, we have a thousand students at OSU with the prevent option. So, uh, I mean, I'll say that the first time that I offer this, I got 25 students. You know, it's not usual that you start like a story abroad with 25 students. I have two groups this summer, and you know, and I know that if I offer this in, in the, spring, the, the winter break, I'll we'll have students. In the spring break, I'll we'll have students. I'm never just trying to create that capacity. But you did strategic. I was a recruit freshman. You know, I mean, you're supposed to work with anybody, but I, yeah, that's that's how I kind of strategically recruit freshmen. I'll also go and present a private blog, and you know, and have faculty. You know, this you know, we'll have one faculty from the vet school at OSU, so students can talk to them. And if I mean, this summer we're taking two students from the vet school. So what I want to do is I, I want to create those interactions, you know, at different layers. We're actually doing like a one health like approach now. Like we're, we're partnering with the medical school and we're taking medical school, the medical students and also pre-med students, so we can, you know, look at the connections between human medicine and medical medicine. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it's a great, you know, like deal nowadays you know, after the pandemic.